Travis, your biggest fan is about to come in the room right now, Maria. <laughs> <laughs> Maria is a, I'm not sure if you know that you're a direct or indirect mentor of hers, you know, yeah. but she definitely appreciates um, what you bring to the table. You know, so I see some new faces, but I think we, we're about 10 minutes in right now. I think it's fair that we get we get it kicked off. You know, so Heath will not be able to join us today. He's, he's, he doesn't have any power and his internet on his phone is not working great. You know, so I'll be a lone host today. I think I got this. <laughs> Right. Um, so just some admin stuff. Um, what we do is very simple, right? Uh, H-Cray Capital, we, we aspire to purchase apartment buildings with our friends, right? We do believe that whenever you take away all these, these apartments and all these money, um, the human element is what remains, you know, so Furthermore, the SEC requires us to be friends, right? We have to have the pre-existing relationship before we can do business together. But at the same time, we love creating that, um, that good relationship. So what we aspire to do is bring um, veterans and uh, um, high net worth individuals together to purchase apartment complex through syndication process to get their time back. You know, so um, in the next 24 months, we're looking to syndicate a thousand units and um, we're looking to grow a lot of relationship with passive and active investors to accomplish that goal. You know, so without further ado, um, Travis, I looked at your intro as far as the presentation go. I see that you have a portion to introduce yourself. So I would not, I would not um, drag that out. So without further ado, Travis Watts, my people. All right, very cool. Is that uh, full screen for you, Hutch? Yes, sir, it is. Perfect, I appreciate it. Thank you for the intro. I love your mission. We connected uh, approximately a year ago at the Best Ever Conference with Joe Fairless. Uh, just fell in love with what you guys are doing. It's what I do full time. And hence, that's our presentation tonight. Everybody here, truly appreciate you making the time to be here. I'm Travis Watts. Um, <laughs> Passive Investor Tips is a name I came up with uh, as COVID started to kick in, conferences started to go away. And I thought, I guess I, I should create some online profiles and uh, you know put this information out that I was otherwise putting out at face-to-face -face conferences like where I met uh, Hutch and Heath. So uh, basically Instagram's where I post probably the majority of my content, LinkedIn as well. Facebook, Bigger Pockets. I blog on there. I've got a YouTube show. It's called the Actively Passive Show, uh, part of uh, Joe Fairless's uh, best ever real estate investing advice podcast. So, without further ado, let's get started with everybody's favorite slide: the disclaimers that we're not talking about uh, any deals tonight. Okay, uh, I'm not here to pitch anything. I have nothing to sell you guys. This isn't a uh, Ashcroft Capital presentation, which is. Uh, where I direct the uh, Department of Investor Relations. What I'm going to be talking to you about is just simply my opinions, my experience as a full-time limited partner investor in apartment syndications, much like what Hutch and Heath do. So quick background, just a couple bullet points. I don't like spending a lot of time on these slides, but I'm a full-time investor, Director of Investor Relations at Ashcroft Capital. I was very active in single family real estate from 2009 up until 2015. I did fix and flips, I had buy and holds, I did vacation rentals, I did house hacking. I did everything on my own and I don't say that to brag, I say that because that was my downfall. <laughs> I burned myself out. I was working actually in the oil industry, believe it or not, 100 hour work weeks and just got burned out. It was just too much. I was trying to go too hard, too fast. And I was looking for a more scalable, passive approach to real estate. Hence why I switched in 2015 to the passive side of investing with these apartment syndications that Hutch was talking about in the intro. So that's about 12 years in real estate. My passion is truly just helping other people in general with something that I have an interest in myself or something that's helped me. And this has been the most consistent, most impactful journey that I've taken in life thus far. And that's what I'm here to share with you guys tonight. So hopefully you're okay with an education only presentation with no sales pitch. That's kind of what this is. <laughs> so. With that, this is the agenda I propose. I just threw this PowerPoint together, wrapped it up this morning, sent it over to Hutch, but I wanna go over investment criteria and how to identify that because I think that's critically important when you're doing this style of investing. I wanna go over investor profiles, talk a little bit about the active side, uh, which is great for so many, and then talk about the passive side, which is what I do now full-time. I want to go into multifamily 2021. This is something I'm asked nearly every single day. 
as my investor relations role is now a good time to get started a multifamily? Is it too late? Where are we in the cycle? We're going to discuss all of that. Then I want to cover a few cash flow strategies with you guys, and we can open it up to Q&A and networking or Hutch, however you end these. <laughs> I'm flexible. So without yeah, so further ado. Yeah, after your, presentation, after your presentation, yep. we'll definitely Q&A, and hopefully we have some time yep. left over for about half an hour for, um, for networking. Yes, sir. Very cool. How much time do we have? 15, 30 minutes? Um, you can take it all the way to um, on, on the hour. Okay. That's to, that's to include questions. Okay, very cool. All right, I'll, I'll try to, to mesh it in there. I can make these things <laughs> an hour. I can make them 15 minutes. It all depends on my talking speed. So very cool, appreciate it. All right, let's see here. Something happened with my PowerPoint. All right, so what is your why? This is how I like to start these is just thinking big picture. That's kind of how my mind works. So let's talk a little bit about financial freedom to Hutch's point earlier. To me, it's the ability to do what you want, when you want, as much as you want with your time. Okay, maybe you want to volunteer more. Maybe you just want, you know, some, some peace to yourself and a little relaxation. Maybe you want to travel the world. My wife and I were world travelers, or I should say that we were before COVID. <laughs> Hoping to get back to that as soon as we can. Uh, more, more time with your kids, more time with family, or just retirement in general, right? We all have a why, and everybody's different in that. But the whole purpose of financial freedom, in my opinion, is to get you to these types of goals. This is not about money. This is about freedom and your goals and your why. So to the point of financial freedom, the way I think of it, the simplest form I can make it is when your passive income exceeds your lifestyle expenses, then you're financially free. So let's use a simple example. So you want $100,000 a year in passive income. So 1.25 million invested at 8%. We'll get into why 8% in just a minute annually would be 100,000 per year. So the way I look at it, most of what I'm investing in is cash flowing real estate. Okay, mostly now in the multifamily space used to be single family, really doesn't matter you guys. You, there's so many things you can invest in, self storage, mobile home parks, dividend paying REITs or stocks. It, it doesn't really matter. So what I wanna show you to that point, talking about this 8% number, is how much do I need to invest to get 100,000 a year from cash flow, using cash flow generically as just yield, basically. So there's obviously some assets here in the in the 2% realm, whether we're talking about maybe some bonds or some annuities, or you know, used to be putting your money in the bank just a few years ago. Uh, th these are the more conservative approaches. Obviously, you, you'll need more invested to get that kind of return, 5 million to be exact. Then here's just the, the simple example. You guys can see it. I posted this the other day on, on social media. I got some really good feedback and shares and comments. But you know why 8%? In 2015, when I was transitioning from single family into multifamily, I was looking for a very conservative, all-around approach to yield. And I was saying, you know, if I sold all of these homes and I sold all these assets I have and I liquidated all my you know, stocks and bonds, mutual funds, everything that I had, what would I be left with net after taxes, et cetera? And if I were to put that to work into the syndications, perhaps, what would be a conservative cash flow amount I might be able to bank on? I chose 8% back then. That's not insinuating for anyone else that should be your number. It's not insinuating that any deal today by any operator would be producing that kind of yield. Although I still feel that's a fair amount in the types of investments I do in terms of cash flow, not talking about equity upside. That's what we're gonna get into today is how exactly that works, what exactly that looks like, and some surrounding topics that I showed you in the agenda. All right, so with that, my clicker's kind of going out, I apologize, but let's see if I can get this here manually. All right, so how to identify your investment criteria. I mentioned how important this is. And what I mean is you have to decide for yourself based upon your own goals, what sectors do you want to be in? Do you want to be in multifamily, self-storage, mobile home parks, office, hotel, retail, stocks? I mean, th this goes on and on, but I'm talking about private placement offerings, okay, which is the, the basis of, of what we're talking about tonight. Apologize. All right. And then you have to decide what kind of risk profile is appropriate for you. There's obviously new development, new construction projects you could be involved with, value add, uh, which is you know taking pre-existing product, making it better again, 
uh, core plus and core, which we're going to talk about more. And then you have individual criteria. And guys, this list could go on to 100 examples, but <laughs> monthly versus quarterly distributions is what I'm talking about here. Cash flow or equity, REITs, real estate investment trusts that are publicly traded or private, or syndications and individual offerings. Which, which class of product, A, B, C, D, et cetera. Knowing these differences through podcasts, through reading, through mentorship, through programs, through coaching, is really important just to get your baseline knowledge so that you can decide what's going to be best for you. And then certain regions, you know, the Sun Belt regions in the southern states, for example, versus maybe the Northeast or, or, or California, for example. All of these are different types of criteria that you'll have to decide for yourself. And, and the point that I want to make is that there isn't a right or a wrong. I'm not here to tell you what to do or what's right for you. I just want to point out that it's important to write this stuff down. So what matters is your goal. And let me show you how that works. So here's an example of, uh, I use the name Sally. So Sally wants 10,000 a month in cash flow so that she can switch to part-time work. Maybe she's overworked right now, like I used to be, 100 hour work weeks, et cetera. And then you've got John on the other hand, who wants to build up a net worth of $3 million by age 50 in order to retire. Two completely different goals, obviously these two folks are gonna have different criteria. So what might that look like? Just for example purposes, Sally might say, you know, I really like the multifamily sector and I like self storage as well. I prefer value add and fixing up pre-existing product. I like core plus, which we're gonna get into in more detail. Monthly distributions would help her hit that goal because she specifies she wants 10,000 per month, not per quarter. Uh, cash flow focus makes obvious sense. She likes syndications, let's say, and B and C class properties in the suburbs of some belt regions. Whereas John might say, you know, I like multifamily as well, but I also like hotels. And new development might make sense. Let's say that he's using a self-directed IRA, for example. So John's not going to be touching or needing this any income for that matter for several years. He might like opportunistic plays, turning things around, reconverting say, a hotel into affordable housing, things like this. Maybe he likes individual syndications. You, you get the point. A class, urban areas, downtown sectors, Sunbelt regions. So everybody is going to be different, but it starts with writing down your goal and you're 42% more likely to achieve your goals if you just simply write it down. And I know guys, most of the stuff I'm covering is simple in concept, but it's not necessarily easy. I think that that could be well said for just this entire sector and this, this entire type of investing. To me, it's just very simple. If you just break it down, real estate just makes logical sense. Affording, affordable housing is needed, but it's not exactly easy to go about betting teams, deals, markets, et cetera, which we'll get into. So that covers the, the first item here on the agenda. Now I want to talk a little bit about active and passive investing because I've done both and almost in equal parts, five, six years in each at this point. So a passive investor, these are generalizations. You may find some things that resonate with you in both profiles, or you may really heavily weigh in on one side. A passive investor usually lacks the time to frequently monitor their investments. They're not going to want to use up their weekends, use up their spare time, to go find deals, to, to manage tenants, et cetera. Um, and you know, that, so they're looking for more of a passive approach, obviously makes sense. They may enjoy reading financial news, keeping up with kind of you know, the high level metrics, so to speak, of the economy and the real estate sector. But you know, ultimately, uh, you know, they value diversification. Okay, so not all your eggs in one basket, no particular, you know, expertise or specialty, just kind of saying, you know, in general, I kind of want to be in these sectors and diversify throughout. So in other words, seeks to match, but not necessarily beat the market. This could be related to stocks too, just a thought I had right now. The index investor in the stock market versus the individual that's doing day trading or trying to hand pick stocks that, that may outperform the market. So that gets us to the active investor. That's more suited uh, towards that direction. Enjoys the business of real estate. You guys, this was the biggest realization that I had when I was doing single family. I did not personally enjoy the business side of real estate. What was I really after? Cash flow, passive income, tax benefits, et cetera. 
But every time I had sprinkler heads break and I had tenants moving out and I had holes punched in my walls, <laughs> this is the stuff I really started to realize I hate this stuff and I'm not a handyman myself. I don't like fixing up properties, but that's just my story. That doesn't mean it, it means anything for you at all. It's just identifying with which would be best suited. And to keep in mind, a lot of active investors are also passive and a lot of passive investors hold some active real estate. I'm kind of a rare case that I'm fully passive right now. Um, they may not value diversification because they may specialize in a niche or a particular market. They may have all their net worth or you know, their, their income tied up to one area, possibly, because it's their highest and best and it's what you know, they know and love. They seek to control, or I'm sorry, they seek control over their investments usually, right? I wanna make the shots, I wanna do the financing, I wanna choose who my tenants are, et cetera. Uh, he or she may have an advantage over the competition. Quite frankly, I didn't. <laughs> As I was doing fix and flips, I got to meeting other people over the years seeing what their returns look like, seeing you know what kinds of groups and contractors they were using. I was a nobody, you guys. I was such an amateur in that space and I could have been doing 10 times better than I was. And I just ultimately decided, hey, you can't beat them, join them. <laughs> that was kind of my philosophy. So I found the groups that were doing it right. I just partnered with them and their deals so we could all share in the profits. And then usually an active investor seeks to beat the market, rightfully so, and maybe they can. In some cases they can't, it just kind of depends. That's why experience and track record are so important. So to the point of active and passive investing, let's look at a couple examples uh, more pinpointed on this topic. So when I'm talking about an active investor, someone who does fix and flips like I used to do, vacation rentals, maybe they're into wholesaling properties or deals, general partner in a syndication, to be Hutch and Heath, for example. Uh, and then the passive investor is the hands-off type. You know, I'm, I'm a limited partner in syndications. Yes, I own some REITs that are publicly traded. Not a huge fan of the stock market, but I do hold some. I've done note lending, uh, high dividend yield stocks, tax liens, ATM machines, you name it. I've uh, even rented out our car on a platform for cash flow purposes. So I've done a lot of creative strategies, but at the end of the day, uh, none of that required my own uh, management because that just doesn't suit me very well. So that kind of covers the active and passive uh, side. So what I want to talk about, because many of you are probably interested in, in knowing more about multifamily, and as I mentioned, uh, you know, is now the right time or, or what does it look like right now in 2021 in terms of multifamily? So I've got some slides and I tried to be as unbiased as possible. I've got slides from all different sources on here that I want to share with you. So this one comes from the REIT industry, September 2020 rent collections. This is something very important, you guys, that I want to point out. Uh, the exit strategy that these general partners are, are looking to sell to, okay? So when, 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 when Hutch and Heath and any other group that's out there, Ashcroft Capital, is buying these properties, they're large properties. They might be a 200 unit, a 400 unit, a 600 unit apartment building. If, if you're successful in your value add business plan, you're going to want a successful execution to get a lot of that profit out of this property. So if you're an institutional player, and what I mean by that is, you know, a, a real estate investment trust, a mutual fund, a pension company, an insurance company, you know, think Wall Street, basically. These are folks with deep pockets, lots of capital to put to work. And what are they all after? Same thing we're after as, as Main Street investors, right? Yield. How do we find yield? in the, the, the environment that we're in today. So this is an interesting metric to think about. And this is assuming that these institutional players pay all cash for a property and use no debt, no mortgage, no leverage. They're still looking at clipping approximately a 5% coupon. That's where cap rates are approximately nationwide and multifamily. Compared to triple B bonds at 3.3%, triple A, two and a half percent, an S&P index is only yielding about 1.5% in terms of cash flow or yield. U.S. Treasuries are around a point. And we've even got negative territory, you know, the, the French Treasury, the German Treasury. So does multifamily look lucrative as a conservative investment, assuming they're not using any leverage? Uh, I, I would argue, yes, I, I'd rather have a 5% coupon not taking much risk by not having a loan on a property. So just something to think about, who are you selling to? In any instance, single family, most often that's just another family, 
right? But in this space, it's a little bit different. All right, this is from the US Census Bureau. This was a survey from July of 2019 through July 2020. And just some migration trends to think about. And the dark blue is what had the heaviest uh, population percentage increase, where people moved to. Obviously, the red is the opposite, where people moved from. So you've got you know, a lot of the Sun Belt region. You've got Texas. You've got Florida. And I'm going to show you some different maps, too, because, of course, all this data is going to be a little bit different depending on which source you pull from. And like I said, I want to be unbiased and show you guys a, a clean portfolio of, of what's out there. So just something to keep in mind doesn't mean that if you're investing in anything that's red, that's a bad thing necessarily. You may know that market well. You may find some off-market opportunity that makes a lot of sense, but just generally something to keep in mind here. Here's another map I thought was interesting. These are kind of what, what these guys did. This is uh, PwC and the Urban Land Institute. They surveyed 1,600 professionals in the industry of multifamily, and they said, would you buy, hold, or sell? And these were kind of their, their top 10 markets based off that survey. Again, a little bit different than the previous chart, but you still see some commonalities. You see the Texas, the Florida, uh, the Carolinas, et cetera. Something interesting there, uh, Merging Trends Report. Uh, it's about a hundred page report, it's free. I can send it to you guys if you want it, but um, yeah, I guess you can't click that link, but <laughs> I'll get it to you if you want it. US multifamily sales, this was kind of interesting. So 2020, Obviously, there, there was a, a decrease in the amount of sales and transactions. Makes sense, right? We were in the midst of COVID. We still are today. But, uh, you know, real estate at the end of the day is supply and demand. So that lack of for sale kept prices lifted. And I'll show you this next slide. By the way, that's from Yardy Matrix as a source. Uh, this is, uh, who is this from? CBRE Research. This is Q4 2020. Basically, you can read the, the headline across the top, multifamily investment to rebound 33% growth in 2021. Uh, pretty incredible. Even if we don't hit those metrics, you can see that you know, we had the decrease in 2020 with an anticipated rebound coming. So it still looks like a healthy, uh, strong market on the horizon from all these different sources here. So just something to think about. Uh, by the way, I'll share with you this just candidly. In 2020, as an LP, I invested in more deals than I've ever invested in in any year. And it wasn't because I had more income, it's because I just believe in this asset. We were still finding good value add opportunities off market at slight discounts. And I still think uh, for me anyway, this is gonna be a great year for multifamily for what it's worth. That's my take on it. Um, couple cash flow strategies I wanna point out, something I mentioned earlier, but I didn't define. I definitely wanna take the time right now to define for you. And this is really about real estate risk. Uh, as we talked about uh, value add core plus and core properties. This is back here to how to identify your investment criteria. And I listed these here. Um, I, I just wanna cover these because these are the ones I invest in. These are the ones that are gonna be cash flow focused. And I think most people are generally uh, you know, persuaded in that direction. And I know too, that's what uh, Heath and Hutch focus on as well. So a core asset, if you ever hear this term or you're not familiar, is a highly stabilized asset. It's usually associated with a lower risk profile, usually in primary or major markets, fully leased, high credit tenants, higher rents. Usually it's A-class, new development or not too old. So you know, again, back to the institutions who are buying these, these assets, um, they're always inclined to buy here in this A-class. However, there's really not a ton of inventory and there's a ton of competition. So you may not have the option to buy a core asset at, at any given time, though you need to for your particular strategy as an institution. So that brings us to Core Plus, which is also a stabilized asset, slightly higher risk compared to Core, may need some minor cosmetic improvements. These might be, you know, falling out of maybe that five, 10 year uh, from being new. Uh, so, you know, minor changes here, possibly a property management change could help increase, you know, the, the NOI, the net operating income, et cetera. And these are usually also in strong markets and or some sub markets. So it might just be just outside of you know, your, your, your major markets. And then we come to value add. This is what I typically invest in. I'm still a huge fan. Again, that doesn't make it right for you or anybody else. It's just this concept that I'm gonna buy something at a discount and I'm going to fix it up. 
and then it's going to be worth more money. <laughs> that's, that's just a foundational thing in my upbringing. And, and I don't know if anyone else resonates with that, but, you know, relate that to like a car. You know, I love the idea that I'm going to buy a car at like an auction or some private party deal on Craigslist. And, and I'm just going to, you know, get a great discount, fix up what needs to be fixed up. And now I have a car that's worth more. That's at least going to maintain its value a little better than buying something right off the showroom floor. Usually cash flowing is stabilized. That really depends. Usually older buildings, in fact, mostly always an older building, whether that's 1970s, 80s, 90s, early 2000s, some deferred maintenance, some cosmetic improvements needed, amenities might be outdated, clubhouses may look outdated, uh, modern things, enhanced security, USB chargers in the wall, you know, security cameras, uh, I, I don't know, barbecue areas, et cetera. The, the property may be lacking these things or may need a little facelift on, on a lot of that stuff. Um, you know, stainless appliances compared to black or white, et cetera, you get the point. So usually these have a higher equity upside potential because you're not as reliant on just the standard market and just inflation and things like this. You're, you're actually forcing the appreciation. You're forcing the value, at least through a, a portion of your overall return. So generalizations again, core assets, you know, five to 7% cash flow on an annualized basis. It really depends, you guys, on the operator, the business plan, how conservative they're being, et cetera. But the point that I'm trying to make with this slide is, you know, core will have the lowest amount of cash flow because you're taking less risk. Core plus might pop up a couple points, uh, perhaps more. It just depends because you're going to add a little bit of value and a facelift to it. Value add usually has uh, a more stable higher yield cash flow, but you are taking on some more risk. I'm not covering right now opportunistic or development, but development's just new construction, new product. Opportunistics like, say you have, I don't know, a hundred unit apartment building that's 20% occupied. Why? There's obviously a big problem, <laughs> you know? So you're having to go in, it's usually not gonna be a cash flow play, at least not in the, the, the short run. And you're going to have to turn that thing around. Whatever those problems are, you're going to have to work with a very experienced group to go in and improve the status of that property and increase occupancy up to 80, 90%, et cetera, for that thing to, uh, to, to have the equity upside in it. I don't really play in the space, nothing against it. Just I live on passive income. They usually don't produce passive income. Simple as that. Uh, so there is no right or wrong to my point <laughs> a second time. What matters is your risk tolerance and what you're comfortable with. And we're all different. That's the point I'd make with that. So I know I'm, I think I'm, I'm good on time here, but final thoughts. I love this quote by Tony Robbins. Most people overestimate what they can accomplish in one year and they underestimate what they can accomplish in a decade. Couldn't be more true in my story. It's true in so many stories. And so I think that the point with that quote is just, Get started, whatever your journey is, even if it's not what we're talking about tonight, you know, start making the baby steps towards your ultimate goals, figure out your whys, write things down, find mentors, find resources. To that point, I try to be a free resource for people. I do 15 minute calls. That's my link up there, calendly.com slash Travis Watts all week long not just with, with Ashcroft and Investor Relations, but with folks that hear me on podcasts or you know, have questions on blogs that I wrote, et cetera, conferences that I speak at. I'm just on the phone all the time in these 15 minute blocks. So schedule a time if you'd like uh, to do a one-on-one -on -one q and I know we're gonna do one here live, but if you've got questions that are more personal or things that, that you really wanna like work through as far as a strategy that may not be appropriate for this call, that's your link right there. I also have a free PDF guide. Uh, that is in no way, shape, or form an upsell to anything. What that is, is it's called Understanding Real Estate Private Placements. That's kind of a different topic. We can cover it here uh, if anyone has questions in the Q&A, but what this is, is how to vet teams, markets, uh, and deals in this, this type of space. It's about 20 pages packed with industry terminology, visual examples, questions to ask GPs, et cetera. Uh, you can get that uh, as well. Just email me, set up a Calendly, Go to, uh, where is that, uh, ashcroftcapital.com forward slash Travis. It's there. It's all over the place. So Passive Investor Tips is, like I said at the beginning, where I post a lot of my content. I'm part of Joe Fairless's uh, best ever team. Uh, I write a lot of the content uh, for them out there on that site. And yes, I'm part of Ashcroft Capital. 
reach out on any of these outlets, you guys. I'm, I'm truly happy to um, add value where I can. And uh, yeah, this is just me, me giving back. I was able to free up a lot of my time through passive investing. Now that time is, is given back to others. That's my mission. That's my purpose. And with that, that's all I got, Hutch, as far as uh, the slides go. So I guess we can open it up to networking or uh, Q&A. Hey, Hutch, Mr. Hutch. Yes, sir, still here. Can you exit um, PowerPoints? Oh, yeah, sorry. Let me yeah, stop sharing. Okay. Cool, no man. Worries. Here you go. Um, here we go. Um, you brought up a, a man. That, that was an amazing, amazing presentation. You know, very in depth, and I think we got some question in the in the chat chat box. But before I forget, I think yep. um, one of the offers that you made is talking about vetting vetting the, the sponsor, the deal, mm -hmm. and the market. Right? Uh, we got about twenty minutes to the hour before we start the that um the networking session. Okay. I think those those three points are very important points to talk about. Um, to, an, to an individual who's aspiring to be a passive investor. And also, if you're an active investor, just kind of understand um, our responsibility to those passive investors as well, right? So we'll ask Glenn question, and then we'll ask for you to, to kind of dive deep into those, those three, three requirements, um, those three considerations um, for investors. Um, so Glenn question is, in, in relation to supply and demand, do you expect that cap rate to compress a little more? My personal opinion on that would be yes, I do. Uh, however, something to note as a limited partner, something I look for in terms of the underwriting in a deal that I'm gonna invest in is, is just the opposite. I wanna see conservative underwriting. So if we're gonna buy a property, or I say we, anybody, uh, a general partner is gonna buy a property at a five cap, like you saw on the slide there, I wanna see an exit cap rate that's actually higher, which would be a negative thing. That means the, the market would essentially be softening, right? So I want to see like a 5.5 cap upon exit, not we're buying a five, we're going to sell at a four, because then you're assuming that the market's just going to go up, up, up and away and everything's going to be great. Well, what if it doesn't, right? So I'm a big advocate of under promise and over deliver as a GP to your point, Hutch. Uh, on the GP side, under promise, over deliver. On the LP side, Look for conservative underwriting. But yeah, my personal opinion is there's still a lot of demand for this product. We're in a very low yield environment with you know the Fed and, and interest rates still near zero. And I still think the institutional players are looking at a five yield and saying, you know, it's a lot better than buying treasuries or you know, keeping money in the bank. So I, I do suspect they'll go down a bit. That's right. I appreciate that. Um, so we're going to go into you talking about those three major points, but we got your biggest fan here, uh, Maria. Um, she's wanted to know what are some, what are some um, check marks you have when evaluating a deal? Yeah. Yeah. It kind of plays into the, the three-part question. Do you want to make that just part of that, that big three-part question? Sounds great. Let's, let's do that. So Hi, Maria. <laughs> Thank you for the question, Maria. You should know this with the amount of content that, that you watch of mine. Uh, just kidding. But so the three main risk areas as an LP, the way I see it in this multifamily syndications, or not even multifamily, just private placements, are the operator or the general partner that you're working with, okay, and vetting them out as an LP. Second is the market that you're actually going to be investing in or the submarket. And number three is the deal itself. Now, a lot of folks who are getting started, myself included, when I first started doing this, I got so caught up on the deal. I got so caught up and send me all your Excel sheets. I want to see all your underwriting. Tell me all about this deal. I want to go visit this property. I would, you know, and, and the fact was what I failed to, to realize, and I finally did after doing several deals that, that didn't go bad, but kind of went sideways. And we ended up exiting it below what we hoped to achieve was it's really so much to do with the operator. It's so much to do with the general partner, their track record, their success, their philosophy, their conservative underwriting, uh, the teams that they work with, the property managers they hire. This is all about the team. So if I were to put a weighted average to these three, personal opinion, 50% should be spent on the team in the general partnership itself. That's what you should really be looking at and betting. 25% on the market and submarket, 25% on the deal itself. Again, you don't have to agree with that. That's my personal opinion. But 
you know, <laughs> in all instances where a syndication deal didn't perform at expectations was, was really due to the operator, to be honest with you, it, it really was. And so all the elements are important, but try not to get caught up in analysis by paralysis, <laughs> just searching at the deal. So let's talk about these three in a little more detail to your point, Hutch. So the biggest thing I can say about an operator and a GP, two things really, track record and experience are important. Being able to show somebody, here's what we've done in the past. Here's what we're doing currently. Here's our portfolio, et cetera. That, that stuff's important. But almost more importantly, I think, is aligning yourself with these folks, okay? So back to the criteria that we covered in the presentation. If I like B-class value add in the Sunbelt regions, monthly distributions, et cetera, I need to go find someone doing that. <laughs> and I need to get along with those people because these are illiquid investments. Your money could be tied up three years, five years, seven years. Last thing you want to do is go park 100K somewhere and then go, you know what? Really don't like these people, <laughs> you know, because it's not a stock. You don't just hit the sell button and say, see you later. You know, you're getting all these updates and communications and webinars, et cetera, for years to come. So you really want to do your due diligence on the operator. You want to align your philosophy. You want to ask the tough questions. What about COVID? What about another 2008 recession? What would happen in that case? Show me a, a stress test or a sensitivity analysis, which would mean, you know, that you've tested this business model. If what if interest rates go up? What if occupancy falls way down? What if a tornado hits the property? You, you just want to ask. And it, it's not that these general partners have to have the right answer. It's just that they've thought this stuff through. <laughs> it's just that they have some some competent answer or something to show you. And so that's really, you know, the, the balance. You know, I would never recommend somebody just see a deal come through on email and just hit, okay, I, I submit to that. I'm going to wire you 100K. Don't do that. Meet with these people. Meet on a free Zoom call. Meet face-to-face -face if possible, especially after COVID. I was doing that a lot before COVID, but Zoom's, Zoom's a great tool. So use it. Maybe you live in California and there's a deal in New York. Zoom call, save yourself the, the flight and the hotel. <laughs> uh, so, so there's a couple points on, on just the team and the general partnership. Uh, you could go way into this too. I mean, you could go into you know background checks and the whole thing and spending a lot of money and time. The, the third point and the last point I'm gonna make on the sponsorship team, get word of mouth references. The way that I've found a lot of deals that I've invested in over the years, has been through other passive investors who have been invested with multiple groups who would just be open with me and just say, you know, I partner with these guys this is kind of how it went. You know, I, I think they're, they're great. I think they're horrible. I think whatever. And not just taking that to heart, but saying, okay, noted. Thank you. And then going and talking to, you know, a hundred other people. <laughs> and then what, what you naturally end up doing is, is you, you get a feedback from a lot of people and you start hearing the same names over and over. And then you kind of get the point, you know, like a lot of people favor this group. A lot of people say, stay away from that group, you know, and I, I don't share this stuff publicly, you know, I don't post this stuff, but, but yeah, I'm happy to have just a personal one-on-one -on -one conversation. That's, that's why the Calendly link, right? If anyone wants to have that kind of call. All right, let's talk about the market. Early on, I'll share with you a quick story. This was like 2015, I wanna say. Uh, I invested in, in one of the first syndication deals and <laughs> we were in a great market, great sub-market, growing area, bought it at a great price. A lot of things were great about the deal. As I mentioned to you, I was all about the deal, right? Failed to realize this particular syndicate group had never really done this before. And, <laughs> Long story short, we, we didn't even come close to hitting the projections on the deal. We didn't lose money, but the market lifted the deal so that we had some equity, right? It was kind of that natural appreciation. Things were just going up. People were moving there. Rents were already bought, you know, undervalued from day one. All they had to do is just change, change the price tag on the website. People paid it. You know, we were saved by the market. You know, but that was really a mistake and it was unfortunate because something I wanted to be in for five to seven years, a business model I truly believed in, we were done in a couple of years and, and, and exited from it and I had to start over from scratch and, you know, 
what, whatnot. So with the market, you want to look for, I mean, I showed you guys the slides on, on a couple ideas, right? Sunbelt regions, Texas is hot, Florida, Georgia, Carolinas. A lot of markets are hot. I don't want to sit here and say these are the three or the one or whatever. There's a lot of great markets, but look for diversification among employment. I think that's so huge. And a reason why I've put a lot of money in Dallas over the last five years is I think this still holds true. There isn't one sector that comprises more than 20% of the job market in Dallas Fort Worth. So I like that because you know, healthcare goes down, you've got other industries, you know, financial, technology, et cetera, and, and vice versa, right? So sometimes you know the airlines get hit hard. Well, you still have a lot of industries to, to pick that up. Unlike, as we all know, what happened to Detroit. In 2008, 2009, 2010, if you were holding a 400 unit and most of your employees were, were at the car manufacturing plants, you know, that's a tough, tough pill to swallow. <laughs> there wasn't enough diversification there. Uh, same used to be true with, with Houston. I would argue it's not anymore, but, you know, it used to be a lot of oil jobs, you know, so you're really betting on oil. If oil crashed, Houston crashed, therefore your property crashed. So uh, again, not to, not to bring that up, that was more of a like 70s and 80s kind of thing, but uh, it's changed a lot. But anyway, there's, there's a couple of thoughts on the market. Now we'll get to the deal itself. Conservative underwriting, man, can save you in so many different ways. I'm speaking to GPs right now. I'm speaking to LPs right now. Uh, we talked about cap rates. You know, if you're buying some at a five cap, project a higher exit cap rate. No one wants that to happen, but if you can still meet your projected returns, knowing that scenario could happen, that's a very positive thing. Don't tell people 4% and then cap rates go to six and then you give them a 5% return and exit them. It's not going to look good. Uh, not going to be good for your track record by any means. Um, let's talk about debt on these properties. My personal take, which again, you don't have to agree with this. I'm just speaking individually. If we're going to do a five-year business plan on something, we're going to buy it and renovate it and get the rents up and then sell it a few years later. I like locked in fixed rate debt would be ideal for twice the length of the business plan. I'm not such a fan excuse me, of these short-term loans and bridge loans. There's a time and place for that. I'm not going to sit here and bash them. But the point is, let's say you only had a five-year term on your debt and you had a five-year business plan. Well, let's say in five years, the market's really soft. We're in the next, next Great Depression. Well, if you sell, you're going to be at a loss. What if you can't get lending and, and extend your debt? You know, you, you're going to be forced to, to sell. You, you're going to put yourself in a really tight, tough spot. So by having a 10-year debt term on a five-year business model gives you five years of flexibility. Okay, what are we going to do? The economy sucks. So what other lending can we get, et cetera? So that's another thing that I look at in terms of the deal. Different people look at different points. I mean, really, this could be an hour long conversation right here. We could go into like cost per door. We could go into how much is in the expense budget, et cetera. Just make sure there's adequate cash reserves. You know, that's a big thing for me, knowing that I live on cash flow. I like deals that cash flow from day one out of the gate. I like you know, monthly distributions, et cetera. And, and really what I'm trying to figure out at the end of the day, let's simplify this whole topic of these three risk points. Here's what, I'm, here's what I'm doing. I'm saying, how realistic is it that you, the general partner, can pull off this particular business plan? And the answer is nobody knows. But I get a lot more confidence by saying, well, we've done this numerous times. Here's our track record and performance. Here's the underwriting on the deal. Here's the stress test that we put together. Here's the partnership that we've created. You know, the more data I have, the more you're painting the picture for how you can actually pull this off. Um, you know, if you just went to some weekend conference and now you're raising $100 million, that's going to be a tough sell. <laughs> so, so that's kind of the yin and the yang and a, and a couple uh, takeaways. Again, uh, take me up on that PDF because there's a lot more that we didn't cover here that, that we could certainly go into. All right. That's um, all I got on that. And Manish, you want to unmute and ask a question? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Rich. 
Uh, hey, uh, Travis, a lot of good information. Really appreciate uh, uh, you sharing knowledge with us. Um, so uh, just my question is, um, uh, what is the minimum spread you suggest between uh, cost of the capital, which is a mortgage and the cap rate going into any deal? Yeah, are, are you talking about like the, the cash flow spread difference? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, it's, I'm not gonna pull my PowerPoint back up, but basically, so a cap rate, let, let's define really quick a cap rate for, for anyone who may not be familiar. So if you paid all cash for a property and had no debt or mortgage, and you paid the operating expenses on it, that's basically your cash flow yield. Nationwide right now for like B and C class property, about a 5% cap rate. Okay, so that's what you could, you could expect basically for, uh, for an annualized cash flow. When you put leverage on, most folks I see right now are using between 60 to 75% leverage or loan to value. When you do that, potentially your cash flow moves from about a 5% annualized yield up to anywhere from I'd say seven to a 9% yield. It really depends on, on the property, right? And the amount of leverage that you're using. But so it's higher risk, higher reward. And so you, you certainly, again, back to my, my three risk points and, and specific to the deal, that's one thing you wanna look at is that the team isn't trying to use too much leverage. Before COVID, what I started seeing is these deals were getting really aggressive. People were putting 80%, 85% loan to value. They kept taking more and more debt to try to make the numbers look better in terms of cash flow, but kind of leaving out the point that that makes that deal very risky. And one other thing I'll point out too on that topic I didn't discuss earlier, and I really should because it's a metric I look at a lot, is your break even occupancy on a property that's levered with debt. Um, I like to see anywhere from, let's say, I would, I would prefer the 60% range. So if you take a hundred unit property and you have a 60% break even occupancy, you can lose an awful lot of tenants or have a lot of tenants not paying rent to get you to at least a break even point, you know, where you're still not losing money. So it's, it's more of a, uh, multifamily has been a lot more conservative, at least for me than single family was because I had levered single family with debt. And so it, on a good month, when my tenant was paying on time and in full, I was cash flowing a few hundred bucks a month. But when that tenant moved out, even if that was a planned you know, situation, I didn't just go to a break even. I went to like a negative 1200 a month because I had a mortgage and I had an HOA and I had property tax and I had insurance. I had bills to pay and I had no income. So I went from 100% occupied to zero into a negative cash flow situation multifamily to me anyway is a lot more conservative because of that break even. So sorry, I kind of went on, on, a, on a trail end with that, but hopefully that spread uh, kind of helps answer your question. The newer the asset, the higher the purchase price, you know, the, the less cash flow you're, you're really going to get. So it kind of depends on what, what your criteria is and what sector you're talking about. Yeah. Thanks, Travis. You bet. All right. It's amazing. Yeah, so we're on the hour right now, about two minutes to the hour. Uh, do we have any more questions? I have one, Hutch, if you don't mind. Okay, send it. Hey, Travis, what do you say like, in today's competitive market where like, you try to conservative underwrite, but you're not going to get any deals, or the GPs are saying, or when you when you conservative underwrite, you're not going to be competitive to, to land a deal. How would you answer that question? It is really, really difficult in general <laughs> to, to be a competitive player in the space. You know, a lot of these larger groups, these larger GPs are getting off market deals because they have a track record experience and they have broker uh, relationships. They have connections with other sellers and they've taken years and years and years to build that up. If you and I partner, Kim, and, and we decide we're going to be GPs and go do a deal and have no experience, no tracker, no connections, we're going to be left with like the leftovers of the leftovers of the leftovers, right? And to your point, that's going to be really tough to make numbers work. And most deals that I've looked at just for fun, like I'll go to, I don't know, LoopNet or something, and I'll start like underwriting. Not that I do this actively or professionally. I just do this for my own sake. I can't make the numbers work um, myself, at least not to the point where it's an intriguing deal. Not to say anybody here can't do that. Plenty of people are, but yeah, it, it, it's a tricky balance to try to be conservative and express that to your investors that, yeah, okay, in year one, we're only projecting a 
5% yield, but we're really trying to be safe and conservative by doing that. We don't want to overpromise to you and say it's going to be eight and then deliver six, you know, so we're going to, and that's, that's a tough sell sometimes because you're certainly going to get the LPs out there that say, oh, 5%, that's crap. I'm going to go find some with a higher yield, but often that's a mistake because you're going to go do a deal that's aggressively underwritten at 10 and you're going to end up with five anyway because <laughs> they couldn't pull off the business plan. So just something to think about. It's a yin and it's a yang. It's, it's not an easy answer. And I feel uh, for you or anybody else out there that, that's trying to, to underwrite that way in today's environment, it's just competitive. And to the question earlier about what do I think cap rates are going to do? It's competitive, you guys. There's more and more training, more and more mentoring, coaching programs, et cetera institutions still having a high demand for the product. I just see that continuing. So anyway, off topic, but hopefully that helps. Yeah. Additionally to, to Ken's question, right? Um, the IS offer doesn't always get the deal, right? So Travis yeah. mentioned that um, a lot of folks, their track record um, is based on the relationship they've created with these brokers, right? So these brokers know the folks who are going to close and that's why they're focus, focused on. Additionally, us as syndicators, we, ha we have to be good um, good stewards of our investors' capital. You know, so just um, bidding up the price just because we want to close a deal is not the best way to do business at all, right? A lot of folks get, in, get, in, get, to, get into trouble that way. You know, so um, stick to your numbers, um, identify all the possibilities that are, are all the, the value add opportunities in these projects. And if there's no more value to be added, then move on to the next deal. Don't waste too much time on these deals that doesn't pencil out. Thank you, Hutch. I appreciate that. <laughs> I should just defer that one to you anyway. <laughs> no worries, man. <laughs> but right. I'd, I'd also add to that one is, is don't be in a hurry. Uh, you don't have to try to up bid or up bid and, and don't be in a rush. If somebody else beats it to you, hey, there are more out there. Uh, hang on, learn lessons and keep going forward. And along that line, uh, I'd like to say thank you, my brother, for your service. Thank you for being an inspiration to all of us and learning how to go forth and do this. You're doing a great job. Travis, an excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dusty. Thanks, Hutch. Thank you, Dusty. Thank you, Travis. Um, yeah, so I just came from Brian Briscoe's, um, meetup and he was interviewing Drew, Drew Whitson, right? Um, and really good individual. This guy is so good. He doesn't, he doesn't even have a website, right? Is is a relationship based kind of guy. And one of the things that he talked about is he made, sorry, I was muted. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> See, I just came from Brian Briscoe's. Y'all miss all that, right? <laughs> no, 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 we, we got the intro, but, uh, okay. yeah, he's, Okay, go ahead. So, so Drew Whitson was a relationship yeah. guy and he made an offer on a um, huge property in, in Memphis, Tennessee, right? Mm -hmm. And he was not awarded that deal. So what he did, he became very resourceful in identifying who actually got that deal awarded. He already had his, had his investors and he brought those investors to the table and he was able to, to secure the biggest part of that general partnership for that deal. So if there's a market that you have confidence in and there's a deal that you are super confident will perform, but you just did not get awarded, there's other way to be resourceful and get into these deals. You know, so that, that was a tactics that I learned. You know, I was, I was in that um, presentation for about 15 minutes and that, that's probably like a million dollar idea. <laughs> that's awesome. Right? So you get these, be a part of these conversation, you pick up those little, those little um, what um, Hunter Thompson would call these $2,000 idea, which we look for every time you go to a, a meetup, whether in person or, vir or virtual, always looking for those $2,000 idea that's going to increase the efficiency of how you do things or is going to grow your business. Awesome. Appreciate you sharing that. All right. So if there's no further questions, um, we can roll into the meetup. Travis, will you stick around for this or you got to go? Uh, sure. I've, I've got about 15 minutes. So yeah. All right. So, yeah. So we'll, we'll make it about 10 minutes. Um, okay. So before we get in there, if you, if you don't mind turning the cameras on so we can get a, what do you call a zoomy? It'd be greatly appreciated. Here we go. They're coming on. They're coming on. Dusty, where you went, brother? <laughs> Dusty, I think you turned the camera on. There you go. <laughs> All right. I'm hey, here. Susan. All right. One, two, three. Go. Perfect. All right, so I go to the breakout rooms right now. If you have to leave, um, please, please do so. Um, but it'd be good to stick around. This is where the magic happens, right? Um, automatically assign. 
And you know, start working on the elevator pitch. Um, don't be afraid to ask for exactly what you want. And it takes some time to get to know these folks that you are in the market in the rooms with. Um, let me see. So I'm gonna do three rooms. It's gonna be pre pretty big rooms so we all can talk. And I let it go for 15 minutes or for 10 minutes. 